Welcome to the panel on building trust and transparency in digital assets. Um, I'm David Creer, and I'm going to be the host for this uh, panel today. Um, we've got um, a great panel of experts here from um, all sorts of areas in the crypto and blockchain world, and I'd like to just introduce them um, in no particular order. We've got Benedict Angera, um, who is the communication and branding lead at Bitpanda. Um, we've got Dorian um, Vinci Leone, who's a business development manager at KuCoin. Um, we've got Philip Veriest, um, who's the head of R&D at Euroclear. And we've got uh, Benedict Kukacha um, from uh, Luca, who's the head of sales and business development in Europe. And he is um, standing in for Suzanne Moorfield, um, who couldn't be here today, unfortunately. Um, so let's get started. So a lot of the time when I think about trust in digital assets, I actually think about the um, underlying aspects of the blockchain that actually promote trust. So the immutability of the transactions themselves, uh, the robustness of the architecture because of the fact that it is distributed um, and if you take down one part of it, the rest of it is still going to be there. Um, in your opinion, Philippe, um, what do you think of the technological advances uh, that promote trust um, when working on a digital assets product? Um, first of all, I think trust and safety is very important. Um, in Euroclear, where we are more in the traditional business, um, of course, safety is quite important. We have, uh, just to give you an idea, more than 35 trillion of assets in our uh, digital vault, mainly equities, bonds, and, and funds. Um, but which means that safety and trust is quite important. Now, when we s go about trust, of course, and we talk about crypto or DLT, uh, I think it's important to make the difference between the two. Um, crypto, we know that there have been uh, some uh, hot period uh, last year, um, but that doesn't re-question to me the technology, which is very robust. And if you look at uh, the number of central banks that are today uh, having a program on DLT, I think ac according to the figures of the BIS, it's more than 90% of the central banks in the world uh, having a program on DLT and some of them already in productions. It shows that uh, there is a trust. Uh, you can imagine that the central banks may, may be the most conservative type of uh, companies. Uh, looking at that at 90% worldwide level is, is a signal. So um, quite importantly as well is maybe to look at the type of technology. Uh, there is a, a big debate between private and public um, blockchain or DLT platform. For us and for the central banks, this is mainly uh, the permissioned type of, um, of platform and mainly for regulatory reason. Uh, we have to make sure, and the same for the central banks, that we control access uh, to the business. We have also to provide uh, privacy, confidentiality, all those components that are quite important and that require to have some intervention, if I may say, on the way we run the activity which leads us more uh, to the private type of setup. Um, now you're gonna say, but well then does that mean concretely? Well, the value for us is mainly the capacity to be able to dispatch in real time data that everybody can trust, and that's important, uh, and build on those data. If you look at the market today and the reason maybe why the market is still in T plus two, it's not because we are not able to settle, it's not because uh, we can't do atomic settlement or whatever, it's because the market is organized in such a way that for every single step in the chain, in the process, you have to go through different system and to reconcile across all those system. If everyone could, of course, have all the position share in a common system and be able to trust these data as soon as they are created and then react on those data, we could certainly move from T plus two to T plus one or even T plus zero end of day. And I think this is the step that the DTCC is trying to do uh, in the US. So for us, this is the challenge. Um, and this is why we are currently building uh, a DLT platform for Eurobond issuance with that in mind, uh, that will be released this year uh, and very exciting project indeed. Sounds extremely exciting and definitely ca getting to T0 or, or, or T1 is, is super important uh, just to reduce the, the risk and settlement. I mean, it's, it's, it's a super important thing and we can't lose, lose sight of that. So, uh, so great to hear that you're advancing so much in that, in that field. Um, so this, this is a question 
um, for uh, Benedict um, at Luca. Um, so <laughs> it took all of uh, 15 minutes to have our first question around FTX today. I was timing it on my, uh, on my watch. Um, <laughs> so after these big, um, let's say, market events where there is a question of foul play, um, do you think on, on, on one side, do you think that that really makes the general public have um, you know, a doubt in digital assets in general, blockchain, crypto, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and on the other side, um, what do you think that the regulators can do to be able to, or regulators or governing bodies or working bodies can do to be able to um, build in structure to regulation and, and, and put some order in standards without actually stifling innovation? I, I, I don't know if you could comment on that. So, so the last part makes it stifling innovation that makes it probably a bit uh, more complicated to answer that. But to start with, um, lack of trust or um, has the public lost trust in digital assets? And you're referring to FTX. I would just start by saying that probably um, where there's light, there's shadow. I guess that's a common, um, that's something that everybody knows. Um, FTX is not a crypto related issue. I would say that's a clear cut criminal case and that will happen in crypto from today and tomorrow, no matter what regulation will bring. Regulation will not be able to prevent things of that happening. Um, that, that's, um, that's on the one part. And I would also argue that there's probably not a lack of trust, but people have started to realize that if somebody, and I'm not referring to any specific case, if somebody's offering you an APY of 95%, something must be wrong. I guess there's a clear rule saying that if something is too good to be true, it probably isn't. And FTX has probably brought that, and many of the other cases has brought it to the mind of the general public. Oh yeah, that's actually true. If somebody's offering you 95%, that must come somewhere. And if you don't know who's paying for that, you are probably doing that. So I would say it's not the lack of trust. It's probably more people are now realizing, oh, there's something we, we, we got to probably should take a closer look at. And I'm not sorry, saying that I analyze everything that I'm investing in, but probably like just because something is going on on Twitter and there's like all these hashtags trending, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good investment. I guess that's, that's uh, to answer that part of the question. And the other one with, I mean, regulation will come one way or another. I guess that's, um, that's, just, that's just evident that it will happen. Um, and the best thing, that we can do as an industry, as market participants, as service providers, all of us on stage and everybody else coming here to the, uh, to the EBC is trying to work with regulators and trying to not influence but help them to regulate it in the, in the right way. And again, I'm not mentioning any specific regulation stuff that's happening in the staking environment and so on, but that is what happens if you're not working um, or if, if, you're, if you're not putting enough effort in it to, to educate people. And I would say we in Europe, we are probably in the more privileged area of having regulators that actually do listen. So um, my colleague, Suzanne, who is um, not here today, unfortunately, um, she's actually sitting on a couple of working groups helping regulators and governmental bodies to with sort leadership and, and inputs to, um, to develop in the right way. That's, that's the best way. W without stifling innovation, I can't answer. I guess it's a balance between like regulating something that is in development um, I guess we shouldn't forget that all the regulators that are out there, they're not, I would say they're not, um, th they're not in the privileged position having overly much resources that it can allocate to that. So a lot of them will have to deal with other topics next to blockchain and crypto and all of that stuff. So um, I don't think we should um, expect them to be ahead of the curve uh, in that sense. That's, I guess, the way to put it. Yeah, that, that, I, I definitely see that. I think that a lot of the people that are in the regulating bodies are, are innovation specialists who have had to become experts in the crypto field, and some of them do it extremely well. Um, I, I, I mean, from, from my point of view, I also see that um, the regulatory sandboxes that are being set up, um, all of these kind of you know, regulatory sprints that are happening at this point in time are, are, are super important as well. So I don't, I don't know if you have the same opinion on, on, on any of those things as well. So... I, in general, would say th the standard answer to that is I appreciate regulation if it goes into the right direction rather than enabling business, rather than preventing it. And I guess if you're following like just what's going on in media, um, you see just different approaches that regulators take across the world. And yes, I do appreciate like regulatory sandboxes in a specific way that allows like innovative ideas just to prosper and see how they would work out in reality. So the I guess the, the short answer to that is yes, 
um, regulatory sandboxes are appreciated. Thank you. Um, so another question now. And if we can jump Sorry, in yeah, yeah. about this. It's actually interesting. We had an example about this in the EU specifically when they were actually drafting uh, MICA before it was uh, actually voted on. They had these uh, attempts at uh, looking at exchange business and how uh, they would try to regulate us and what they would want from us uh, in terms of possibilities for users with uh, sending and receiving crypto. And at the beginning, they actually thought that it was a possibility to constrain us to be able to reverse transactions on the blockchain. So th that's just to say, uh, that's something that's obviously not possible for a totally decentralized blockchain like uh, Bitcoin or Litecoin, whatever. And that's something that they learned from, from experience, from listening to us and speaking to us as uh, companies that are actually part of this ecosystem. So there is room for improvement there. Like at first the reaction was obviously people were very concerned, very worried about this kind of approach. But in reality, when the law was finally passed, uh, this was not the conception that they had anymore. So there is room for improvement. And even laws that are being set now, they can still improve in the future. Like th there is constant discussion between certain institutional bodies and crypto related businesses. Uh, situation that we have right now is not fixed. It's clearly a moving, um, like moving landscape, and like we have to stay tuned to really see what's going on and how it will evolve in the coming months and years. I, I suppose it's kind of like a learning process for both sides, right? Isn't it? I mean, the, so on one side you have the, the regulators who are understanding the technology. On the other side, you have the technologists who are building towards more regulated products. So it's, it's something that we all have to do together. That's really interesting. Might I just add a little little tad to that? If we look at regulation, I understand that regulation often, especially in the crypto industry, when we are growing a lot of new industries and, and areas of expertise, um, is something new. But the underlying reason why we have regulation to close the circle with FTX, which is a scam and a fraud case, naturally, is to make sure that the retail customers, all of us who use crypto as asset classes and for their underlying technology, to make sure that these people have regulation to protect them. And if it may be with the case of sandboxes, our personal experience with regulators is to have an open conversation, somewhat of a, of a partnership, um, and therefore be in the forefront together with the regulators to come up with regulation that do exactly that, protect the end customer protect the retail investors that are not the experts uh, on this topic as most of us in this room would be, right? So I believe there is a, a, a good, good bridge between regulators, us in the crypto industry, to make sure to provide an environment where everyone can have a fruitful life there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's a hard balance, I think, between, between that and allowing innovation and not stifling innovation. And that's very difficult for the regulators to get right. But they, 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 are, they are getting there, I think. And I see it's definitely a lot better than it was five years ago where we didn't have any clear regulation at all. Um, so, so that's really good. Um, so, so for you, Benedict, uh, just a quick question on misconceptions. So I think for me, a lot of the um, lack of trust in crypto um, you know, not necessarily from, from regulators, but also from the general public, probably not people in this room who are very much involved in crypto, but, but more generally. Um, it comes from these common misconceptions, which are often based on negative aspects of crypto itself. So, for example, it's heavily used in the black market, uh, or the majority of it is used in the ma black market, which is probably not the case these days, because the majority is actually used in investment, right? Um, from a communication advisory point of view, how do you think we can kind of change the hearts and minds of the people so that they don't have these, um, let's say, common misconceptions and they can kind of get rid of this like negative negativity around crypto, which I don't think is really fair? Um, to start my answer, in the previous panel, it was a brilliant discussion on a very similar topic. Um, for me, the misconception with crypto is somewhat a little bit laughable because when you consider how much um, money fiat currencies are used on the black markets, which is physically not traceable with actual physical cash, 
uh, crypto on that side is, is way safer because it's fully transparent and we have enough tools, as everyone knows, to track the, the path of crypto through the blockchain uh, technology, right? So in that sense, for me, I see it's super important to more or less repeat and repeat and repeat this point on platforms that we all get access to, uh, for example, this, con uh, this uh, convention. Um, but the underlying issue for misconception, in my opinion, is the lack of knowledge. And I'm gonna go very broad here in more or less saying, looking at my brother who lives in a small town in Austria, he doesn't know how money works properly, right? And don't get me even started trying to explain crypto to him, right? So in my opinion, and this might be a little bit of a bold statement, why do people need to understand it in the first place? Same as uh, I believe not very many, not many, very people understand the blockchain technology in itself. And it's very similar to the internet when it came up. No one, do you know how an, an email actually works in the background? We just use platforms that make it extremely user friendly and convenient for us to use the essential added value to it. In my opinion, um, to gain back the trust um, is a through working together with regulatory um, arms, uh, definitely, but also if we look around at players who enjoy currently a lot of trust, which they have built up again from 2008, are banks, regulated institutions. And I believe the big challenge from a communication standpoint as well, by underlying the trust in an asset form, is uh, to start trying to work together with people who enjoy a lot of trust in the industry. I know that the Web3 discussion and banks uh, is a little bit a different one. Um, but yeah, that, that would be one of my aspects from a company perspective. Also looking back at, at the history of Bitbanda, for the last nine years building technology and providing easy to use access to our users, uh, we now shifted our focus or split our focus to offer the same seamless access through banks via a simple API. Again, not taking away for the banks to fully understand it, but to understand A, the benefits of offering that asset class and additional asset class like fractionized stocks, commodities, and so on, to an ever-growing demand of users and retail customers especially that read about it for the last 10 to 15 years. And FTX, in my opinion, even stronger this argument because the demand, I mean, you guys are still interested in crypto, right? Even though FTX happened. But now I believe the shift is coming from understanding that not the asset class itself is the issue, but actually the company selling it to you. As a very, very blunt example, do you guys wanna have your salaries paid to a bank account in, based in Hong Kong or the Bahamas, or do you wanna have it at a bank you trust, right? Meaning a partner you can trust. That for me is, is an approach to try to con convince the ever-growing battle of, of trusting crypto. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think we're gonna get more, more and more institutions, um, more and more big players uh, that, that are getting involved and I suppose that, that will mean that there'll be more access to more people, people will be more informed, people will trust more the companies that, that, are, that are using it and, and that's, that's really important and that, that will change the way that people think about things. Um, you to add something yeah, there? Maybe just a, a word about that and, and link with regulation that we just discussed. Um, the traditional business is heavily regulated. I have to, can believe really, really, really regulated. Now, the reason for that, as you said, regulation is there to protect the end customer. And each time that there is a crisis, each time that there is a fraud, the regulators come back and put a, a di an additional layer on the existing regulation. We are still paying the subprime crisis of 2008, 15 years later, I, mean, I don't know if everybody was there, but 15 years later, we are still paying that. And this is why I think regulation is necessary, but it's important for crypto to go for regulation. Because there was, I heard in another panel, self-regulation, that was, was the bank was promoting before the Lehman crisis 15 years ago. But there is always one guy, could be FTX, could be another one, there is always one guy creating the mess. So you need to protect and to make sure that this is done. And the more you collaborate, the nicer the regulator will be. So it's not, they are not enemies and should not be considered like that. They have a role to play. And if the crypto world gives the hand to them, could be better than, than the opposite.
Yeah, I, I, th I think, you know, so the regulator and also governments as well will eventually have some advice for their citizens around, around this. And I think it won't be in the, uh, let's say, in, in the hands of the commercial banks or in the hands of private companies to be able to kind of give this kind of advice as well. I think that eventually when we get to a point at which the regulation is open enough for people to be able to really use cryptos kind of more, more generally, I think that potentially also governments might weigh in and give their, give their citizens advice as well, hopefully. Financial advice from governments, that would be fun. <laughs> um, so, so Dorian, a question for you. So for, for me, um, one, of the, you know, one of the biggest leaps of trust um, for a crypto is actually using it as a payment um, service. So if you want to, I don't know, buy something, you need to know that you're, what you're using to pay for that thing um, is, is secure and that it works properly. Um, uh, GFT, alongside a collection of banks um, and also other technology companies, we launched a thing called the UDPM, which is a payment network for um, stable coins and also in the future CBDCs. A couple of um, countries uh, like El Salvador, Central African Republic have also um, legalized Bitcoin as a legal tender. Um, What's, what's your opinion on this, and what do you think the impact is from an uh, economic point of view when financial markets move across to these new payments, uh, let's say, rails that are based on digital assets? If you can comment a little bit on this, your opinion on that. So it's a pretty large question to start with, and um, so it will be m more my opinion and my take uh, with m my background in economics than uh, KuCoin's opinion as uh, this is like more of a broad concern than just uh, like the way an exchange operates and uh, what kind of activity uh, we have to do and, and things. So actually th this kind of payment system that we see right now relying on stable coins and being implemented more and more and preparing the field for CBDCs uh, technically speaking, we s we have not seen any any problem with it. Technically speaking, it works. Like uh, th th this is not the issue. As you mentioned, it's more like trust. But when you think about it, uh, you are tr already trusting a digitized financial system already every day. Every day, your bank account is just numbers on the screen, and you are trusting it to do uh, to process payments, to process wire transfers like you tell him to do it, because we have been relying on this digitized aspect for transaction for, and for the traditional finance industry for decades now. So th this is already a starting point. I don't think this is that much of a switch, actually. The, the boundary has already been crossed in terms of digitizing the process, in our minds at least. So making it uh, from a, with a CBDC emitted by a central bank, minted by a central bank, uh, that's an official body, regulatory body. Uh, for people, for most people, the, the gap will not be that huge. Um, so that, that's the first thing. Then uh, regarding like um, what kind of impact it will have, if we go back to economic theory, there are uh, more like uh, broad impact. First, it will reduce transaction costs. So that will make us uh, do business more efficiently. By cutting transaction costs, we are probably stimulating economic growth in the near future thanks to this. We are cutting some middlemen, um, making the whole process more efficient. That's like the most obvious uh, aspect to it. Then in a second, well, in second part, we can look at uh, uh, another aspect of the question is where we stand when we ask this question. So we are in a system where traditional financial system is working more or less properly. You can rely on it to send money to your contacts, to your friends, to your family. This is not the case everywhere on the planet. Actually, you mentioned Salvador and the Central African Republic. There is a reason why the developing world is more interested by this technology than the traditionally called developed world because their financial industry uh, doesn't work the way uh, our does. It's n way less integrated. Even sometimes just doing a transfer between two banks of the same country but two different banks will be really will take you time and will probably be something you have to argue for and argue with the banks so that they really realize this transaction. So th that's why in some part of the world this is like much more um, interesting and much more convenient than we would think here. 
so in this regard, it will bring more inclusion, financially speaking, to these people, um, for people who are underbanked or who don't have banks at all. Uh, this will definitely be a, the source of more financial inclusion. At least that's what we expect and that's what we hope for. And then in a third time, you, you mentioned the fact that uh, we trust our banks and we want to receive money at our banks. And, and there is actually also a necessity for that is that it's a very oligarchical market in its structure. The, bound, the costs uh, to enter this market are very high. And what these technologies are doing is that they're actually reducing the costs and the barriers to entry on this market. So that's very interesting because we are bringing more competition in something that was definitely oligarchic just by the way it's organized naturally because these costs are, are just so huge. You cannot start a business and go ask for these licenses and have the, <laughs> have the possibility to mint your own currency. Like no, nobody will let you do this. Nobody will. Uh, so right now we have the technological possibility to do it. With it comes the regulatory challenges that we are facing at the moment. But in the end, in a third time, we will probably see more and more uh, competition in, in this uh, field regarding like payments, regarding uh, the emission of money, and how um, it will be organized within states and between states. So th th that's the, the three main uh, approach, three main points we could, um, I guess, we, we could envision in the near future. Thank you, thank you. That's a very comprehensive answer, and I, I agree with a lot of the points there. Um, so this, this is a question for each one of the panelists. Maybe we'll just go in this direction from Philippe uh, on, uh, to um, Benedict. Um, so maybe in just about a minute or so, uh, what do you think is the biggest challenge at this point in time to be able to improve uh, transparency in digital assets, uh, products, and solutions? Well, in terms of transparency, I think what is important is to be able to to have a view on who is holding what when it is necessary. Uh, certainly for the securities market, this is the one of the biggest challenge. There is today nobody that has a view for one specific security on all the investors, uh, which is sometimes needed for the issuer himself or, or needed for the regulators. Uh, and that's a big challenge. Today there is a lot of process to try to identify the final investors or for the final investor to be recognized for him to take an action, to vote on something, to exert certain rights, etc. So there, in transparency, DLT could help a lot uh, by making sure that those data can be accessible, um, depending on certain rule, of course, uh, and that will put oil in the machine for sure uh, to run everything more smoothly, which is the challenges that we have in our, in our businesses today. Thank you. Benedict? So I guess the the easiest answer to that question, how to provide more transparency, is buying our product. That's uh, probably the short answer that I would give. Um, the longer answer would be, it will take time, um, and I guess the biggest hurdle for that would be, and we mentioned that a couple of times on stage, is probably education. Uh, the good thing is everybody can do something for it. Uh, I guess going to the EBC is one part of that, um, getting your knowledge from the internet, media resources. I guess there's a lot of things that you can you can learn for free. You don't have to pay for expensive courses. I mean, if you want to, you can. If you need a diploma for whatever reason, there's there's plenty of opportunities today. That hasn't been the case like four years ago um, or a couple of years ago either, but um, that's just a natural development that will take time. So education, knowledge, that is one of that. Um, and yeah, um, the t time will tell. I mean, may maybe just coming back to something that we mentioned earlier, no matter how far regulation will go, there will always be cases like Wirecard, Enron, FTX, all of those. Regulation will not prevent that. Regulation is there to protect, like what we already said, like every client or um, a private individual that is entering the space. And no matter how hard regulation will try, there will always be someone waking up that is dumber than what you can ever imagine. So we will not, we will not be able to prevent. I guess it's a fine line between regulating the right way and over-regulating and making it harder for everyone. That's, that's what shouldn't happen. And to close that remark, again, it's education, it's knowledge, and whoever shares that and whoever gets that is, is probably uh, will benefit from it. Yeah. Thank you, Dorian. At KuCoin, uh, we actually think there is an actual thirst for knowledge, uh, but not only knowledge about uh, how these 
things work, but knowledge about what's happening behind the scene. That's why we started implementing this proof of reserve mechanism that we are showing every month. Like every month we update it. And we're actually looking to work with uh, auditing firms, auditing companies that are recognized in the space uh, to try to audit our whole, like, uh, our whole balance sheet. But the problem is it has never been done. And right now, like we had this experiment with Mazar a couple of months ago, and they retracted themselves from uh, their their own statement because, like, they are not sure about the doability of what they are doing. Like, th this is uh, really something that, since it has never been done, the first one who will do it will take risks, and I guess nobody's super keen on taking risks this year, so. <laughs> Maybe in the coming years, this will be a, a different um, perspective. But the fact that we are providing these tools, not only that, like uh, we're also providing now a KuCoin wallet. So it's a non-custodial wallet that you can use, obviously, like uh, any non-custodial wallet to keep your own assets and um, then come to trade on the exchange and, re and safeguard your, your assets under your own responsibility as soon as you n need it. And this is kind of the first step in a direction where we envision more hybrid solutions between non-custodial and custodial. Because yes, uh, as somebody mentioned in a previous panel, and uh, I, thi I think that person was right, not everyone will go non-custodial. Like th this is not a mass market product that can be understood by the mass in current circumstances. And our goal is still to reach this adoption, this massive adoption. So how to do this is probably to fit uh, each type of individual customer with the type of products that they, are, they would be most likely interested in, meaning that if you're ready to step forward and have custody over your own assets, then we will prov provide you the tools to do so. We'll provide you the, the products to do so. And uh, um, we, we are thinking even about ways right now, technically speaking, we're investigating in ways of trading from your non-custodial assets uh, and still be able to access the services uh, of a centralized exchange. So these are the ways that we're exploring at the moment to see if technically speaking it is, it is doable and if there is a, a real interest into it for, from users uh, overall. So all these questions are being uh, addressed now and maybe that's also due to the circumstances. Like due to the circumstances we have more time to build, people are not so uh, uh, like following markets as much as they were. The, the, um, like let's say the momentum of the market is not there, so there is time to build for probably all centralized exchanges right now. Like we, we are all uh, trying to find new solutions, uh, bring more people in the space, and at the same time provide products uh, to people who are ready to go through the next steps and who want to custody but still be able to use our services to be there for them also. Thank you. Um, I'll make it very brief because I agree with almost everything you guys said already. Um, but again, from a company perspective, um, yes, education is extremely important. It's a lot of access to education, so I'm not gonna deep dive into this. From a company perspective, uh, perspective what's wrong with my English today? <laughs> from a company perspective, um, I think it's essential to come up with procedures that your customer base over a period of time starts to trust you, right? And the right amount of transparency, especially from a company perspective, transparency is always like this uh, fine line of how much do I want the user to know for security purposes. I cannot give them the handbook to everything, but they need to have enough access to understand how the processes in the background work to give them the capability of trusting a company, right? At Bitpanda, for example, we hold more than 100% of our customer funds in cold storage, so it's not connected to the internet, right? I'm gonna stop there, looking at the time, not overshooting. Thank you, super interesting, and thank you uh, to all the panelists. Um, I don't know if we have, we have a few minutes now, um, so we have maybe two or three minutes for q and I don't know if there's anybody in the audience that has <coughs> any questions for any of our esteemed panelists. Over here, I don't know if there's a mic going around uh, for, for the audience members. Thank you, thank you very much. That was uh, really interesting. Um, so when we look at building trust, transparency, 
that would clearly be heading to increase adoption, right? To get more people using it. And I found it super interesting when you were talking about payments and payments gateways. And we can even think about the early days of the credit card. You know, when people said this is gonna this is gonna flunk. When you look at what we're doing nowadays with cryptocurrencies, which industries do you think are gonna be the ones that are gonna help to get that traction, if you see my point? Something that you could see, okay, the layman person on the street that is not that savvy to say, I can access this better using these kind of assets. And of course we could say gaming right now, but gaming is for you know the, the, the generation way, way <laughs> younger than the people that are here. Thank you. Who, who wants to take that? Yeah. I take this one. When you're talking about a classical retail investor, like my brother or my mom, right? Um, I believe that for the broad public, the most amount of trust they currently have regarding finances is still their banks. And I don't think this is going to change uh, in the next coming years. Looking at possibilities for banks working together with cryptocurrency companies, I see a huge potential, right? Just have a banker look at uh, the data they have from their users and see how much money actually goes from their user's bank account, cash, to cryptocurrency trading companies like KuCoin, like other exchanges, or go even further and include stocks as well, right? So I believe the best step we can do from an industry perspective, a cryptocurrency industry perspective, is to try to come up with corporations, new ideas, product ideas, to work together with those industries that actually hold a lot of trust. And funnily enough that you mentioned gaming, I know a lot of uh, conservative people who, who look away when it comes to gaming at all, right? So I think it's always hard to find the middle ground to, con to include everyone. But I believe for the broad public, we need to go with companies that they trust right now. We can go with a bold personal take, right? So I'll say real estate. And I'll leave it like that. <laughs> real estate, like the most individual in kind of asset class investment with crypto. We'll see where it goes. I guess one other element that you also just reading between the lines in your, quest, uh, in your question is not only about the transparency, it's about like mass adoption. Like w w what, what needs to happen that this goes like, like 10x or like the hockey stick that everybody's waiting for? And my bold claim on that would be the industry that makes it possible that people are using it without knowing that people are using it. And I'm coming back to the other question we had before, like in terms of misconceptions. I don't know about you guys, but whenever you talk to people about crypto, there is no one not having an opinion. I've never met someone who is not saying, oh, I don't know about anything, so I, I just don't have, everybody's gonna have an opinion. Um, and I would say it's, it's similar to like emails and uh, the early days of the internet and how a car works. Like, like in theory, I know how, how, um, how an engine works, but I don't really care, just use it. That's what I'm like, focusing on. And I guess the industry or that player that will make it possible for the user to use it without knowing, hey, they're touching blockchain because there's still these misconceptions and stuff. And, and it's gonna take a couple of years, if not decades, if that is, if that is gone. Yeah. Philippe, I don't know if you wanna add anything. Well, maybe just one word. I think for safety in this case, they have to me two points. The first one is to know what you are buying and that's come back to the education to make sure that you understand because it's quite volatile instrument, all those cryptos that you understand the logic. And two, that what you buy is properly managed, that there are no bad surprises, and this is maybe the regulatory part to it, to give you that trust on both components. Perfect, thank you. Unfortunately, um, we're out of time now, but I'd just like to thank the panelists. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for being here, and uh, enjoy thank the rest you. of your EBC.